Praise to you and peace from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. On Palm Sunday, we remember Jesus our Lord riding to Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that was in fulfillment of the prophecy by Zechariah in the Old Testament some 520 years previous where the Holy Spirit revealed that to him. And let me read that to you from Zechariah. He wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now just think, that was written some 500 years previous, and God brought it, brought it to pass in Jesus Christ who fulfilled that prophecy, John chapter 12, the next day a great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that this had been written of him and had been done to him. Isn't it great that we have a God who tells us things ahead of time, before they come to pass, so that when they do come to pass in Jesus Christ, we may be all the more sure and confident that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And uh, on Palm Sunday, we celebrate how that Jesus came. He came as king, right? as righteous and having salvation and also humble sitting on a donkey's colt today i'd like to talk with you about humility and what does it mean to be humble do you think sometimes we misunderstand what that means to actually be humble what do we have to do to be humble and why is it so important for us how many people here are humble today are you the most humble? <laughs> exactly. If you raise your hand and say, you know, I am the most humble person in the whole world, well, guess what? You're not, because that's a proud thing to say. <laughs> but today, our humble king, Jesus, comes to teach us about what it means to be humble and about the importance of that in our final parable, in our sermon series on the parables of Jesus, which we've been doing through Lent. So let's look today at Luke chapter 17 at the parable of the unworthy servants that Jesus told, so that he can teach us about a humble heart toward God. Let's take a look here. Luke chapter 17, verse 7 to 10. Okay, here we are. Jesus said, Will any one of you who has a servant, or slave, it can be translated, plowing or keeping sheep, say to him when he's coming from the field, come at once and sit down, at table, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, and gird yourself and serve me till I eat and drink, and afterward you shall eat and drink? Does he thank the servant or slave because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that is commanded you, say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty. So what is Jesus after here? He's teaching us about the attitude that he wants us to have as God's servants, an attitude of humility. And uh, think about this. Now, I want you to participate and answer these questions. Yes or no? Does a lowly bellboy at the Hilton Hotel who goes into a conference room and meets Mr. Hilton himself expect him to go and bring him a cup of coffee? Answer? No. A little more zest and, and no. fire here. No. no. Does a lowly private in the army come in from a, a field exercise with the troops, grubby, and expect the general to come and serve him dinner? Answer? No. no. Does a lowly slave appear unannounced before his king and expect his king to come and bend on his knees and serve him? Answer? No. no. And in fact, there's nothing different between Jesus' days and our days. Jesus says... Will any one of you who has a slave 
Plowing or keeping sheep, say to him, when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down at table? Will he not rather say, prepare supper for me? Encourage yourself and serve me till I eat and drink? And afterwards, you shall eat and drink? Absolutely, certainly. That's the way it works, then and now. The lower serves the higher. The slave serves the master. The bellboy serves the CEO. The private serves the general. The slave serves the king. And Jesus says, that is the attitude in your heart I want you to have, you need to have before God. When you go before him, remember who he is and who you are. He is the creator, God, and the king. You are the humble servant, a sinner saved by grace. And so go, therefore, not demanding of him to give thanks for you, for your work, or, or boasting Hey, look at what a great guy I am. Speaking of your great talents and gifts, uh, don't go to him as if he owes you for your service, or boast in your own works or your own personal merits before the king. But <clears throat> Jesus says, when you go before God the king, say this, we are but unworthy servants. We have done only what is our duty. Duty. That's a great word. You almost have, almost have to be a British Navy admiral to say that well, right? Duty. <laughs> Duty is not a word that we use a whole lot uh, in our day and age. It's kind of fallen into disgrace, disuse, and disrespect. But it's a great word. What does it mean? It means to do what ought to be done. Just imagine if you are uh, a lowly sailor. You're in World War II and you, you save the ship from, by some heroic act of yours. And you go before the admiral afterwards, and you start boasting of how great you are and what you did. What's that going to do to your works of service? Spoil it, right? You might even be demoted. And instead, what you ought to do when you go before the admiral, even after you've done all your service, say, I am but a lowly sailor. I've only done what was my duty. And what will the admiral do? Exalt you. Therefore, God says, in Psalm 27, let another praise you and not your own mouth. Listen to that again. Let another person praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Good rule? Amen. Good rule. <laughs> so let the admiral promote the lowly sailor. Don't, as a lowly sailor, promote yourself and brag. You might go to the brig. So Jesus, what is he after here in this parable? What's he trying to say to you today? He's after the attitude of humility. A right attitude to have before God and your fellow man. Take the low position, Jesus says. Be humble. So, why? Why is that important for us to hear this message? Why does Jesus teach this zealously, repeatedly, throughout his ministry? You know why? Because we're all prone to pride. <laughs> to self-exalting ourselves. It's everywhere in our culture around us. Consider an athlete. An athlete doesn't want to just be content to be one of the crowd. He wants to win the Heisman Trophy. A businessman wants to be on the cover of Forbes magazine. A sailor wants to be the captain of a ship. An actor wants to be a star at the Academy Awards. And even the housewife wants to have a better house than all the other women that she knows. It's even in the saints, the disciples. Remember, you'd think Peter, James, and John would have it together. What do we read? Luke 9, an argument arose among the disciples as to which one of them is the greatest. I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. Peter, no, no, no. I'm number one. James, no, no. I'm number one. Me, 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 number, number one. Buy for number one position. Jesus comes along. He picks up on that, discerning their thoughts and their hearts, and he took a child and put him by his side, and he said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. For he who is least among them is the one who is great. Did that get into the minds of the disciples? They kept on messing up with it, as do we. He dealt with families. Consider the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Remember that? James and John's mother come before Jesus, and she goes, Jesus, something I'd like to ask you. Here are my sons. What is it? What would you like for me to do for you? Grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and your left in the kingdom. 
What is she asking? Pride. Be exalted above their fellow man. Be number one. And that same thing as each one of us, friends, that desire. Think about Peter. Jesus said on the night of his betrayal, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, Scripture says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And Peter answered and declared, though they all fall away, I will never fall away, Jesus. Peter even bonds himself against Scripture and says, even Scripture prophecies can't stop this one. I'm the best. I'm better than all these other yahoos over here. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And what do we know? Just an hour or two later, he's invoking a curse upon himself, saying, believe me, I never knew the man. What's that teach us? Psalm, Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But we also know in Proverbs 15, it says humility, though, goes before honor. If you want to go high, you go low. If you want to go low, you go high. If you followed that, I didn't, but. <clears throat> Check it out. It's even in churches, right? Pastors, I've heard this, I haven't experienced it myself, but pastors go to conferences and they're like, well, how big is your church? You only have 100? I have 4,000 in mind. <laughs> Lord, which one of us is the greatest? Right? Jesus preaches this parable against pride. And he says, when you've done all, you're to say we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. For pride is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. That's why Jesus preaches on it repeatedly with zeal throughout his ministry. That's why we need to hear about it. That we have a, a preached against pride and a humble heart. And I want to ask you, do you? Do you have a humble heart today? I'm a little more scared to answer that. <laughs> So why is Jesus so insistent upon this and preaches against pride and for humility? Why is pride so dangerous? Here's a few reasons. Number one, because it's the mother of all sins. It's the very first sin of our forefathers. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? What was the temptation? Eat of this fruit and you should be like God. Gee, God's holding out on you. Why are you going to be small? Become equal with God. Set yourselves above. Exalt yourselves above him. Pride is the mother of all sins. And it's in each and every one of us still to this day. Luther, commenting on this, said the apple, you know, the forbidden fruit, still lies heavy in everyone's stomach, causing it constantly to belch. <laughs> I, I wondered whether I should say that up here, but I chose to. But you know what? Pride was in our first ancestors. And it's still in each and every one of us. It's so easy to come out. That core of that forbidden fruit is still in each one of us, causing belching, as Luther says, and that uh, it's even in the saints. Some of the core is still even in them. But what did God do? He drove them out of the garden. He would not have pride in his garden. That should teach us a lesson. Secondly, God will not abide with pride in heaven. <laughs> it was the sin of the devil. What do we read in Ezekiel 28? God says of him, you are blameless in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Satan looked into the mirror and said, I am the most beautiful. And God said, therefore I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings. Mark God's judgment against pride here. He threw him out of heaven cast him down to the ground, and cast down all of his devils and demons and angels with him, and committed them to pits of nether gloom to be kept until the judgment of the great day. God will not abide with pride in heaven. Does this not cause you pause? Does this not scare you away from pride? Well, here's a third reason. Pride spoils everything. Just think when someone is proud, how it just turns your stomach, unless you're the proud one. It makes you stink to everybody else around you. Consider an athlete who wins the big game and everybody's applauding him and he gets to the microphone afterwards and said, I did this all myself, doesn't have anything to do with you guys. All of a sudden what happens to the applause? What's the reaction? We're gonna throw him into the bus. 
pride spoils his athletic abilities. How about a musician? You go to a concert, and he says, we're having a big sing-along, and then he says, you guys all sound terrible. Doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Listen to me sing alone. What happens? All of a sudden, his mute melody sounds like the screeching of a cat to the audience. Pride spoils his music ability. How about if you're a housewife, and you keep a superbly clean house? Anybody do that? Well, you then invite your neighbor, neighbor over and say, look at what a great house. You can't do half as good as this. Pride spoils the cleanliness and makes her house look like a garbage dump. Pride spoils everything. And then how about a Christian who, in the freedom of the gospel, chooses not to drink any alcohol? Abstinence. But then he looks down his nose at some drunk, and he says, ah, I'm a much better person than he. What does pride do there? It now makes his abstinence from alcohol smell like an old stinking beer bottle. Pride spoils it. And in Luther's day, he said the nuns to him stank to high heaven for their pride. For they boasted of their chastity. They said, we've never had sex with a man because Christ alone is our husband, therefore we are better than other women. And Luther says, and he actually asks a pardon for it, he says, you know what? You know what? God would rather go down to the whorehouse in town to find a wife, because there at least he may find a humble soul who is willing to hear the preaching of repentance and faith in the gospel of a son, and be washed of her sins, and become a pure bride for himself. But chastity spoils... Uh, pride spoils chastity, just like it'll spoil every other thing that makes you odious to God and odious to other people. And instead, when you go before the king, Jesus says, take the low position. And when you come before your fellow man, take the low position. And say to the king, we are but unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So beware of something here. The world around you is going to teach the exact opposite of what I'm teaching you here today. The world says, if you want to get ahead, you want to be great in this world, then seek after your self-glory and, and promote yourself. Think of all the self things we have in our world. Self-help books. Self-love. Self-esteem. Self-promotion. Self-exaltation. In fact, if we're even willing, there's self-magazine. <laughs> Check it out. We even have a magazine devoted to self. Wake up, gorgeous. Overnight skin fixes. Woo. Okay. <laughs> what does it say of the last days? Paul says, in the last days there will come times of stress. For men will be lovers of self, proud, arrogant, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so Jesus says to the world, and wrong again, totally opposite, just like our children's sermon, what is high will go low, and what is low is going to go high. So in other words, go low. Now, with humility and serve one another, so that in the end, you'll be exalted. For isn't this what our king himself, our humble king, who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey do? He took off his own clothes, though he's king of creation, girded himself with a towel, got down on his knees before the disciples, and washed their feet. He says, if you're going to be great in my kingdom, that's what I delight in. Humility, service, counting yourselves beneath another person and serving them in that. That will make you great. Beware, next, of pride, because it leads to destruction. It says, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Can I reinterpret that for you just a little bit? Pride leads to hell. Beware of the scribes, Jesus says, who like to go about in long robes and love the best seats at the marketplaces and the places of honored feasts. They will receive the greater condemnation. What kind of condemnation is he talking about? In hell, at the judgment, on the last day. If you want to exalt yourself today, you will be humbled on that day. If you humble yourself today, you will be exalted on that day. So the answer for you is... Humble yourself to may be exalted. For Isaiah says, The Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is high and lifted up. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the pride of man shall be humbled. 
And the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Isn't that beautiful? When we stand there as humble servants on that day, who are we going to be exalting in? Ourselves? We're going to be saying, praise to Jesus. All righteousness is his. He did everything for our salvation. All worthy is the lamb. Praise God. The rat, Lord, and in the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall triumph and glory. It's written. And humility, then, goes before honor. It says in Proverbs 18, If you're a lowly sailor, you save the ship, giving your own uh, life on the line, and you take the low position before the admiral, what's he going to do for you? I'm but a lowly sailor. I just did my duty, sir. What's he going to say? You! You are a man of great worth and great character. You not only save my ship, you take the low position, I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to promote you above your peers. I'm going to set you up on high. Humility, God says, goes before honor. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to receive the kingdom of heaven like a little child? By the way, you're never, ever, ever going to enter into it, Jesus says, unless you become so. So, what's it mean to receive it like a child? Humbly, and how does a child receive something? You give them a gift, can they pay you back for it? Answer? No. no. Say a little more gusto here. No. no. And in fact, some of your children are still not able to pay you back. <laughs> and they're old. <laughs> right? Children don't pay back their parents. They receive things as a gift. And when we go before God for salvation, we can't go there boasting in our own merits as if we can pay him for our salvation and say, look how great I am. We've got to go as humble sinners who are unworthy and we receive the kingdom by grace as a gift. And it's God's great delight to do so. For no man living will be justified in God's sight by works of the law, by their own righteousness, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But we read the righteousness of God uh, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe has now been revealed. For there is no distinction, since everyone has sinned, and everyone has fallen short of the glory of God, they are justified by His grace as a gift. Say gift. gift. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation by His blood, to be received by faith. He did everything for your salvation. You receive it as a gift. So let's now make sure that we're there. Okay? Can you receive the kingdom as a child right now? Say this. I am not worthy of salvation. I don't boast in my own merits or works. Jesus did everything for my salvation. And do you receive him now as your Lord and Savior? Say amen. amen. You receive that kingdom then as a child, as a gift. Praise be to God and your glory in God. Humility goes before honor. But now, here's the next question. What does it mean, though, to be humble in your life? You know what? I think a lot of us kind of misunderstand that, and we got this sort of old, forgive me, but Roman Catholic poison from monkery days idea. Like to be humble, you need to have a little, a little, uh, you know, pole or a, a string of, uh, you know, to flail yourself in the back. Oh, I need to be humble. I'm no good. I'm lousy. I'm terrible. Get out of here, lady. You're distracting me. <laughs> you do not need to be dark and humble, uh, sorry, you need to be dark and dismal and lacking confidence in order to be humble. Was Paul a humble person? Yes, he was. What does he say? I can do all things in him who strengthens me. What else does he say? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. And finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. This is a humble man speaking. Does God want you going around saying, I'm so lousy, I can't do anything. Oh, I know I have some gifts, but I can't even use those. Oh, what a humble person I am. Forget that. Confidence, joyful, rejoicing, using your gifts. That's being humble, but you are not exalting yourself over other people. Let each of you think of no, not think more of himself than highly than he ought to think, Paul says, but to count others as better than yourself. Be strong in your gifts. Be rejoicing. Be confident in them, but use them as a lowly servant to serve everybody you meet and go before God with that same lowly attitude. 
That's what it is to be humble. Let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. And this is the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, he rode into Jerusalem humble, mounted on a donkey, and a colt the full of a donkey. He girded himself with a towel. He served his disciples. And we read this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he was God himself, he was unequal, he didn't count that as something to exalt himself or, or with, but rather he took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. What is it? What do we see of Jesus? Down, down, down he went. Next verse. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So the message is, following Jesus, down, 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 you'll be exalted, high, 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 on the last day. And Paul says, far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. God says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, but this is the man to whom I look, he that is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. Final word here. I want to ask you a question. One more little question here to conclude this sermon. That first parable we read about we are unworthy servants, we've only done what is our duty, that's to teach us about our attitude that we're supposed to have toward God. Does it also teach us about God's attitude toward us? No, it really doesn't. That's about our attitude to God. We're unworthy servants. We don't ask for thanks. We don't expect him to you know, serve us. But what is God's attitude toward you? We read that in Luke chapter 12. Jesus says, let your loins be girded and your lamps be burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the marriage feast. So that they may open to him at once when he comes. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Watch this. Are you listening? Truly I say to you, he will gird himself and have you sit at table and he will come and serve you. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? The admiral himself will say, since you've done this thing and you've done it in humility, I myself will get down and serve you good. I will get down and serve you. And I will promote you. In fact, the king will say to you, because you've done this, you've received my son, hey, friend, why are you sitting down there so low? Come up here. Sit with me on my throne. Reign with me in the kingdom to come. Ride well in the high and holy place. And also, also, with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. The last day is a day of reversals. And get the message now. Go low, that your king may set you on high, for the king delights in humility. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, humble, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Amen.